we thank you for blessing us with this opportunity to come together, to fellowship together, and to learn together in your word. And so as we're gathered today, we pray, Father, that we will allow you to, to commune with us and to fellowship with us. Give us the opportunity to learn and understand your word more, your heart more, your desire for us even more, and help us to align those align our desires with your desires for us and that understanding that as we align those things with you that lord that we will live the life that you that we were designed for and there's nothing more glorious than that so we thank you for this in all other things that you bless us with already in Jesus' name amen amen so well just good morning again good morning good morning good morning good morning next movement church and so i just want to say happy first sunday morning to you all can you believe it's november already that's what I want to know. Can you believe it's November already? We've been doing this online since we've been here together in this way since since Resurrection Sunday or just before. And so can you imagine we're all the way in the month of November and that alone gives me chills. Not even not even the weather, just the fact that we're still sitting here in November. And what a year it has been. What a year it's been. And you know, the old saints used to say, through it all, through it all, I learned to trust in Jesus. I learned to depend on God. Amen. And so that's just the, the thing that I've been thinking about all week long is that we, if nothing else, have learned to trust God in, a, in new ways. Amen. And so I'm just glad that you've decided to join us again in this virtual house of the Lord. If you're new here, we just want to say welcome. And if you've been here for a while, again, thank you so much for coming back so that we can dig into the word of God together. So this is our 13th week. Can everybody hear me? Thumbs up. 13 weeks. How, what, what did I just say? How many weeks have we been here? <laughs> Where is you in the chat if you're alive? 13 weeks. Yes, 13 weeks. And so we've been here for 13 weeks and we are digging through some of the most foundational spiritual practices, which are rooted and they are absolutely rooted in the life and experiences of the early church. So most of what we discuss, you can pick it out right from the, from the Bible and see it in the lives of the disciples themselves. So these are disciplines that have endured from the first century church onward. And they're really at the core of how we live our spiritual lives today. So I look forward to this time each and every week, and I hope that you do as well, because we have an opportunity to explore things that are working. And if we put them in practice in our lives, we will, we will likely get results that we could have never imagined. And so if you're just ready to move forward with this lesson, you know how we do it. The weather's cooler, so you should feel good about it. Just go ahead and stretch it out today. Get the hands up, get them hands up, get them in the hair. Get them in the air, stretch them out, stretch them out, feel good. I see some thumbs up coming my way, amen. <laughs> and so we are just, we're here and we're prepared and we're ready to move forward. Now, if you are here and just interested in getting caught up to where we are, I know 13 weeks seems like a lot, but there's a, there's, you'll stay engaged and you'll catch up quickly. So you can catch us at nextmovementchurch.com. Just click on the sermons tab and you'll find all of the messages that you missed and you can get the information you need to have the confidence to move forward. All right, so we've just laid a really solid foundation. And good morning, everybody on Facebook. I love you, Facebook team. Love you, everybody here in the Zoom room. I'm going to need you today because I've got a lot of questions to ask. So I'm looking forward to my chimers inners, <laughs> my chimers inners today. Um, so before we do that, I always like to start with what? Our definition. And so I do this every week. I mention it every week because I believe that it is what helps us to be in the right frame of mind for this series, always. So let's take a look at what we, what Professor Brian Eck has to say, which is that spiritual disciplines have been used over the centuries as a means to help people of faith reorder their lives. So the purpose is to address the disorder, the dysfunction and disconnection by reorienting how one thinks, one behaves, and relates to God and one's community. So we've spent a lot of time looking at the, the three Ds, as we call them, and this disorder, dysfunction, and disconnection. And we have spent a lot of time discussing how those things are connected to our inner life. And so once again, these spiritual disciplines, often called spiritual practices, are not just here to give you spiritual muscles. It is a great thing that you feel that you get stronger. It's a great thing that you feel more equipped. 
it's a great thing that you're able to, to figure out how to undress from that disorder, dysfunction, and disconnection. But if we only do this, we are not using them the right way. It is a benefit, but it is not the, not the only way they should be used. The true goal is to increase your capacity to live your life with God for the sake of Christ and others. So to truly embrace the spiritual disciplines the right way, we always have to start with one more D, which is what? Desire, right? That's the other D. So we want to fix the three Ds by fixing our one D, which is desire. So unlike many other faiths, you know, we always say effective Christian spiritual practices are less about our ability to master the practice itself, but instead it's based on our desire to do what's necessary to keep company with Christ, right? That's what it's about. Our ability to keep company with Christ. How much, how can you keep company with Christ? How can you get closer to Christ in your practice? So if we're using these practices to do anything other than that, we are misusing them or we're abusing them. Okay. And so when we misuse the spiritual practices, we are transforming them from being gateways, altars, meeting places, meeting spaces to just gymnasiums where we're gaining spiritual muscle and nothing much else. And so we need to change that. We have to remember it's a place for us to get together with God. So when we learn how to design our and just keep our desires aligned with God's for us, we get a really healthy relationship with him in that space and it does not become abusive. And usually the abuse is just one way. It's us telling God what we want, what we need, how we how we want him to do it. Why didn't he show up for me? Because I did these things. You know, that's that's what we're trying to get rid of in our lives is that that sense of entitlement that he owes us because we chose to meet with him, because we've met with him. So I think that clears that up for this week. All right. So we, we are committed to walking through some of the disciplines and we committed to that and we started doing that a few weeks ago. And we used an approach that mirrors what we what's in the spiritual disciplines handbook um, by Adele Calhoun. And so there is an acronym in there that has been kind of guiding our discussion and it comes in the form of the word worship, right? W-O-R-S-H-I-P. And so when you ask why worship, we always remember that worship is at the center of all that we do. And it should be at the center of our desire when dealing with and practicing spiritual practices. So again, let's break down that word worship once more, and we're going to continue with that framework as we move on with today's lesson. So again, our journey through worship starts with a key or framing question that we should always ask ourselves before entering into any spiritual practice. And so we explore worship by asking ourselves, how do I want or need to be with God. So I'm asking myself, do I need to just actually worship him and acknowledge that he's the supreme treasure in life? Do I need to open myself to God? Maybe I'm holding all the control and I need to release myself into him. Maybe I'm spending, I need to spend more time relinquishing the false self or the, or the heart's idols. And you know, these, this creeps in in such you know, sneaky ways. I mean, there's so many things that we're told make us better professionals or will make us better, um, better workers or better, better family members. And we get all these tips and tricks from, from people, but not always understanding that sometimes we create a false self and we bring that self to God that we forget that we have our unique self and unique flaws. And we need to open that up to God when we come to him. Also, it may be that we're looking to share our life with others. This is always an interesting one to talk about. Also hearing the word of God. Maybe we need to spend more time actually hearing the word of God. That is one thing I really appreciate about, about the Hebrew faith and the Hebrew Bible, that it is very much a, a spoken word, that they believe in the practice of speaking and reading it out loud, much like what we talked about in devotional reading, and hearing the word and in hearing it, how it transforms us to hear it. Um, because the world was created with the word being spoken. And so we need to do more speaking of the word. Also, we, we may be looking for ways to actually be 
be Christ in the world, you know, be Christ's love in the world. And this can be, this sounds easier than it really is. Um, and we can, def we'll definitely talk about that in weeks to come. And the all, the all encompassing spiritual practice that everyone knows about prayer, um, probably is the most widely used practice and often one of the most misunderstood that there's so many different ways to pray and so many different reasons for praying. Um, it's good for us to get a refresher on what that also means. Now, over the past, over the past few weeks, I did ask you to pick a starting point, but this week I want to reflect on the pattern of desires that we've covered. So I'm going to leave this up because I want to review what we've done in the first week when we talked about spiritual practices or the actual practices themselves, the first desire we covered was worship itself, the W. And so we spoke on what it means to worship God. And we concluded that worship happens when we intentionally cherish God and value him above all else. And worship is going beyond. I mean, it, we might use singing and, and, um, and soaking as a gateway to worship, but it also goes into our desire to live that life that portrays a really unique beauty that God gave each and every one of us. So all of us have a really unique beauty and we are here to reflect that unique beauty back to God. There's something he gave just you and he wants you to reflect that back to him because it's him in the end. Amen. And so we talked about worship and what that means to reflect that beauty that he's given you back to him. The second desire we covered was openness. Remember we talked about that and we talked about openness and the practices that really lead us back into surrender. And we spent most of our time exploring the practice of devotional reading, which is such a great one, and some ways that you can modify it so you can stay engaged in your devotional time. So this is one of my this was one of my favorite practices to discuss because we mostly, you know, step into devotional time a little willy-nilly, not knowing there's a way, a structure and a way to do it that will act that you can get the most out of it. And th so I really enjoyed being able to walk you through what those motions of worship can be of um devotional reading can be. Now, last week, we extended ourselves into surrender. And these are practices um, that really lead us to, what's our big R word? Relinquish control to God. And we explored what it means to just give up, to abandon, to completely release something that we have the power to hold on to. One of the most effective disciplines Leading to this practice is the discipline of simplicity, you know, the actual practice of simplifying. And that, and we looked at simple simplicity, not because, well, not because we all want to live in tiny houses, even though I think it's, it's definitely ambitious and admirable. Um, but we looked at simplicity because it aims at loosening our really excessive attachment to owning and having things. And when you're practicing simplicity, it does bring with them it a freedom. And it also brings a heart of generosity when we learn how to let things and let, let ideals go. So, you know, this isn't a practice that's just focused on reducing material things in our lives, but it's the freedom to get away from envy. It's the freedom to get away from inadequacy. It's a freedom that also helps us move away from entitlement, you know, for the, the fact that we think we should have and why don't we have yet and I should be at this place in my life. And, you know, these are all things that simplicity helps to address. It also helps us to, to speak honestly and and without fear of repercussion if I'm speaking in my in my truth, right? And it also helps us to speak honestly without double meaning. You know, we, we give a lot of sort of kind of maybes, you know, we, we like to cushion things without just saying what they are. And if we're working in simplicity, it helps us to just say what is and stand comfortably in that, or at least firmly in it. it may not be always be comfortable, but firmly. And if not, and simplicity does do another thing for us. It also helps us to let go without grief 
And most importantly, it, it grounds us in that identity of God's love. It really gives us that opportunity to understand that we are loved and our identity is in God's love and not in what we've accumulated, not in what we've achieved or not in what we possess. So simplicity is really it helps us to be grounded in all that's important, which is, which is God. So this week, we are moving on. So what did we cover? We covered the W, we covered the O, then we covered the R. You didn't know I was doing that to you the whole time, did you? <laughs> and so now this week, we need to cover the, what's next in line? Who, who's next in line? What's the letter? S, there you go. Good job. <laughs> I see you, Deanna. Got that S in there? So S is where we're going next. And and what does it say? Deanna, what, is, what does S say? Share my life with others. Share my life with others. Woo! This is going to be a good one. So sharing my life with others. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about what it means to share my life with God. But now let's talk about what it means to share my life with God by sharing my life with others. And so this is tricky. Um, and it's, it's a tricky one for many of us because we've not done a great job being balanced in this area. It's very all or none in our culture when it comes to sharing our life with others. So some of us are, can be extremely independent. We really promote independence. And so some of us are so independent that we just become selfish. And we only interact with people when it's time for us to tell them how amazing we are. <laughs> so, you know, when we're ready to show the highlight reel, that's the only time we're ready to interact or when we're bored. And so... There's, there is a danger with just that, right? And so there's also some of us who are so codependent that we just become clingy and rely on others for our self-worth. And neither of these extremes are in God's plan for us, right? So let me take you on a little journey because... The first thing we need to answer is the difference between codependence and interdependence. We need to answer that first. And you can you can really you can really find this with any simple Google search. But here's a definition that I I learned from a therapy center in New York, and it reads like this. It reads in codependent relationships there is a reliance on one partner needing the other, which creates a sense of stagnancy. Interdependent relationships, on the other hand, allow room for growth and change without feeling threatened. So what we're looking at here is the difference between being un able to function without people or a certain person in our lives. And what we're exploring today is different than that, which is interdependence. So we have the, we have the person that would just, exactly, would just die without you. Like if you're not in your, if this person's not around, I'm just going to simply die, right? They, there's that, that's codependency. But what we're looking at today is that it's interdependence where we do need each other and but we are still distinct and in even though we're distinct we need each other to complete a task does that make sense so there's a difference between someone being the air that you breathe and interaction with them being the air that you breathe or relying on them to complete a task so a, a way to think of this is that if you work in a if you work in a in um in a workplace somewhere you've worked in a workplace there are some jobs that are interdependent because this job relies on this job and an assembly line it's very interdependent if we don't fix do this widget we can't put it here and we can't put it here and we can't put it here so we never finish the product 
And it doesn't take away from the uniqueness of each individual piece. It just means that we need you to be your individual piece so we can complete the task. We need you to be you to complete the task. And so I, so we're talking about that level of interdependence where we are almost a well-constructed assembly line that comes together to produce greatness, right? There you go, Lisa. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. But we still need the parts, right? We need the parts to create the whole. And that's the thing is that we don't become just some proverbial mush. So, <laughs> so here's my first question to you for this session as we're talking about that codependence versus interdependence, you know, that clingy versus, you know, just needing. It says, I want to find out from you and I want you to, to talk to me, let me know. What does it mean to share your life in a world that is designed for privacy? And this is just your thoughts and your feelings. I love to hear from anybody and everybody if possible. But what does it really mean to share your life in this world that we live in, which is designed for privacy? It's designed for you to be often by yourself in your own space and nobody else's business what you do. So what, what does it really mean to do this, to share your life? Come on in, Deanna. Well, it's the difference between self-centeredness and the attitude that you include those around you. Mm. Uh, we can be totally focused on me, myself, and I, or include, first of all, God, put him first, and then those around us are, are second behind God, um, because they are his creatures. He created them. He created them to learn to love Him. And if we don't include them and we know the Lord, how are they ever going to... I mean, God can speak to them directly. I know that. But He has given us the task of sharing to be inclusive. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Crystal, I mean, you know, that's the thing is that He really has... Um, given us the task of finding ways to share ourselves with others. So we we may have our preferences, but we still have a responsibility. I, I love what you're saying there. And well, we as humans, we like to pick and choose. Oh, y'all like this one. Ooh, y'all <laughs> like that. Uh, God loves everyone. For God so loved the world. And uh, he doesn't look on the outside or what they have or their personalities. He loves them. And he tells us, love others as I have loved you without limit and without cause. Mm, without limit, uh, without cause. Sometimes it's tough. Woo! Uh, Is it ever? As I, I remember a situation back in Chicago. We had a big, it was a big old church. And... Um, the neighborhood was changing, and there were some people that, some people would come up, well, we'll put them up on the balcony. And my pastor was from Canada. <laughs> he was fantastic. <laughs> you will not put them up there. You bring them and sit them with your family. <laughs> God loves them just as much. I don't care what they look like, what they smell like. God loves them, and so should you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Something about those Canadians, huh? <laughs> Amen. Oh my gosh. He, he, was, he was uh associated, he was in music too. Yeah, uh, he played the organ and piano for Moody Bible Institute. Oh wow. So uh, and scholar oh he could preach the word. Um uh, yes, those those Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> <That was. laughs> but um yeah, it was it was a point that some people didn't like to hear. Well, ooh. No, but uh, yeah, you love them. God said, love each other the way I love you, without cause and without uh, limit. Mm, I'm going to be touching on some of that. I'm definitely going to touch on some of that today about what that about how that fits into our interdependence 
And I'm, I'm also looking at Lisa adding, she said, sharing things that are important or precious to you. You know, for me, my time is quite limited. So sharing this is a precious commodity to me. I share with those that, that matter like us. Thank you, Lisa. We love you. <laughs> and, and Beth is adding as well too online. Um, she says, when we, when we say that we are followers of Christ, we must follow the examples of Jesus himself. He always yeah. shared himself with each and every person that he met. Wow. This is great. And I, and it's so important for us to remember that sharing is such a big part of how God has designed us to, to, to live. And so one of the simplest ways for us to explain that connectedness to one another is to commit to, I like how Adele puts it. She puts it as, um, the one another's and does everybody just say to yourself, the one another's, if you would type that, write that somewhere. If you're taking notes today, I want you to write the one another's there's a, we're, we're grouping these in a, in a special way by calling them the one another's. And so the one another's are scriptures that def, scriptures that can't, that define how we interact with one another. Okay. So everybody got that? Mm-hmm. I'm going to say it again. The one another's are scriptures that define how we interact with one yeah. another. One another. Perfect. How's my volume? Everything okay? Perfect. So um, the first one another, Deanna just, you know, bashed over the head just a moment ago. She talked about love. And this is just, I mean, and when we think of this love, you know, the, the love is like Jesus and the Trinity are one. He's a part of the Trinity, right? And so him and the Godhead are one. And so the followers of Jesus are designed to be one. They were supposed to be one and one with him. So we belong to one another and cannot be fully connected to Jesus without being connected to each other. It's a part of the deal. So we want to connect. You can't just say I'm connected to God the Father or I'm just connected to the Holy Spirit without taking the rest of the Godhead, right? And so we also have to understand that we are designed as the body of Christ to be interconnected. We need each other in order to get the fullest picture of who we are and where we belong. So when we're familiar with, we're familiar with certain scriptures that have to do with love. We're familiar with the love is patient, love is kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast. You know, we're familiar with that stuff. But today I'm going to take you through some others, some other scriptures. I'm going to talk about a bunch of one another's and I want you to keep track of which ones we talk about because they are some of the hallmarks of how we can find ways to interact and stay connected to each other, whether we're in person or not. So let's start with, um, and they're all actionable. I want to make sure I say that too. We can we can do this. So tell yourself already. If you already have trouble with church folk, just go ahead and tell yourself, I can do this. Just coach yourself right now. Come on. I can do this. I can do this. Tell yourself, I can do this. Yeah, yeah, I see you coming in. I can do this. I'm telling myself, I can do this. <laughs> I can do this. So the best place, I guess, we're gonna for us to start is right in the word, right with Jesus. No better way to start. And we're going to go to John. I'm going to start in John 13, 34 to 35. I think I'm here in NIV today um, for the most part. And I, I might switch back and forth. I probably will bring some message in. Um, and I did um, do some back work with ESV this week as well. But let's start here with John 13, 34 through 35. And it reads, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. But by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Oh, I've heard this scripture. I'm glad. I'm glad. Because so a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. But by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Amen. They know you're my disciples if you love one another. So here's a question for you. Put it out here for me. In your opinion, what are some ways that we can love one another the way that Christ loved us? What do you think? Respect. I got I got one vote for respect. I got another one coming in for healthy boundaries are difficult with this. Yeah, it is tough. 
it's tough because we feel like um, there's this all encompassing, no, no limits, no boundaries stuff going on. Like there's, and that's not necessarily the truth either, is it? There are some, there is room for boundary. There's, there's room for boundary here, but what is it? What does this look like? You know, how do we love? What are some ways that we can love the way that Christ loved? I got it. Uh, so we, like I said earlier, we respect one another, but we also have to take care of each other. Um, we have to um, let others be safe. Let others, well, be kind to one another. Be, wait, make, you don't necessarily have to make it everybody happy. You just gotta know, you got, just gotta know that you care for them. As if you were like a friend. Oh, you don't have to make everybody happy. You just need to care for them like they're friends. Interesting. Comment peanut gallery. I like it. Or like it, their brothers. And like their brothers, even better. Um, because it's funny you said brothers in particular. And also, <laughs> uh, also, I love, I love what I love what Camila's bringing in. Also, say acceptance, even in indifferences. I am going to nail that one to the floor today. I promise you. That's a good one. Kindness and patience. Whoa, you guys can just teach this whole lesson today. I am so <laughs> excited. I'm just so take a look at another love scripture. I didn't go for all the super familiar ones today. I'm going for ones that we don't explore too often. Here's another scripture Romans 13 and 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. One. For whoever loves, Others has fulfilled the law. I heard this one too. Mm, this scripture is an application of the one before. So who would like to share some thoughts on this one? Anybody have some thoughts on what this means? Um, this is probably not what it means, but it just makes me think of if someone, um, if someone has huge debt and they can't really pay it off, that um, maybe they would ask a friend to come and help them. Oh, it's good. you're getting close. It's actually some. I'm not going to talk about it just yet. Let me see what everybody's thinking. You're in the right. You're in the right house, though. You're in the absolute right house. Right house. Any thoughts? This is just. This is an application of this in a very specific way. So, any thoughts on what? What did it? What does it even say here? What's it even saying? Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Ooh. So I'm, as you're thinking through that, yeah, I like that. Lisa's adding, this is part of the Great Commission. Yes. What's the Great Commission? Oh, about us going into all the parts of the world to preach the gospel? Oh. Yeah, we're extending like, the kingdom everywhere we go. It's like I heard the scripture. I just don't know where it's from and what it's it good. means. And you know what I'll say here is, and and I'll I'll help help you walk through this a little bit. But this one isn't just. I know it would seem that when it says "let no debt remain outstanding," that you may want to think of one party versus another party. But what it says here is not to let a debt stand between you and another person. Now, it's speaking to both parties. The debt, tor, and I guess, was it, the debt-y? Is that what you would call that? So the person that owes and the person that, the person that gives. And so whether, if you're the lender or the borrower, and, and if you're the person that's giving in any way, if you've shared with someone in any way and they owe you something, it says, don't let that debt stand between or that, that debt. It could be emotional debt. It could be, it could be, there's so much debt. There's so much ways we can define debt, but we could talk about financial debt, emotional debt. But if somebody isn't owing to you, right, it, it, it cautions us to not just be the person who owes, who doesn't, who gives, but also be cautious if you're the person who's running up debt. Stop running up debt on people. Stop borrowing. So <laughs> stop borrowing. So let's talk financially. Let me just talk about this financially because it's, it's going to speak to both. How many family members 
or families do you know that have been broken up or never talk to each other anymore because they owe money to each other? But yeah, 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 right, right, yeah, exactly. We've seen families ruined over the over the owing of money. Yeah, neither a lender or a borrower or be. Hey, I like that, and it's and it's tragic. It's tragic. So if you can afford to, if you can't afford to give it away, you probably shouldn't. You sh you probably shouldn't give it. And if you don't intend to pay it back, you probably shouldn't borrow it, <laughs> right? So don't engage in debt whenever possible. Don't engage if you don't have to. That's one thing. Now, you're right. There's a, there's a lot of other debt. There's emotional debt. There's all kinds of debt. What it's saying is that there, you should never be in a position to do anything but really love people, that it shouldn't skew your ability to love anybody. Be careful how you're engaging with others. But what you're going to find is that Every scripture that we talk about today, there's gonna, it's going to be two-sided. It's going to talk about what it means to be codependent. It's going to be, it's going to talk a bit about what it means to be interdependent in a situation, or be on one side of the giving transaction and on the other side of it, you might be the the receiver. So we're going to talk about both sides of it from every scripture. And so let's look at another way that we can talk about our independence. So I just wanted to throw that out there because what it says to us is that the only debt that we should have is to love one another. So I don't, I, the silliest way to think about this, and I call it silly, is that, you know, when you, when you see that couple or you see that, that movie and they say, and the person says, I love you. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. And it's, <laughs> it's almost like that's the only type of debt we should owe each other is to love each other more. <laughs> maybe not, not, maybe not so, so sillily. If that sillily is not even a word, but there you go. Have fun. Not, not in such a silly fashion. But the, what we're saying is that that's the only time that you should feel indebted. Is to, is to owe someone love and commitment, love and commitment. So be thoughtful about that. All right. So let's let's look at some other ways that we can cultivate our interdependence. And we can another way we can look at it. What the first one was love, but another way we can look at interdependence is how we encourage one another. So let's take a look at Hebrews, Hebrews thirteen, and I've got verse eighteen here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list off a few scriptures today. You can always go back and take a look at them. Yes. I'm seeing you chiming in over there, Bev. Yes, forgiveness. We will, def we, we will talk about forgiveness today. I think it's important. It says, now let's talk about this one, encouragement. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. I like that. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today. That's very poetic. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Well, this is a neat one. What are, what are some thoughts? What are some thoughts? What are some thoughts on that? What, do you, what can you tease out of that one? But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. They feel like riddles, don't they? <laughs> don't they feel like riddles? Well, let's see here. You know, when we think about this scripture... There is definitely something that we're being asked to do and on, a, and on a frequency. So anytime that you're doing something regularly, why, why do you do it? What, what's the purpose of doing something regularly? What's the reason why you do something regularly? Come on, Indiana. Are you, are you on mute? Uh, it should be a choice, not a habit. Mm. We do things out of habit every day. Well, no, I just do this. Good morning. I mean, I really don't mean it. You know, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> 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 uh, but some things we just, we get in the habit of doing things and saying things out of habit. You know, like, God bless you. Are you really thinking of God blessing this person? Or is it, uh, you know, uh, is that just a habit? Right. Something that comes out without thinking or without really meaning it from your heart. Yes, it's and so true. so we're being deceived, and it's a sin to not mean what you say. Mm. 
That's yeah. that's important. And it, and in saying that, in saying what you're saying right there, to add to that, like Bev is adding that to tell someone how you feel about them today because tomorrow's not promised to anyone. I like that. I like that addition. Yeah. Thank you, Bev. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, I mean it's true. It's a as long as it is called today. Like this is your today is your opportunity to yeah. to send that encouragement, you know? Wow. I love that. I think this is a good one because and it's neat because you know for me it also it's the reminder that we all need to be coached and uplifted. You know, we sit on a, we sit on these on on sending encouragement and words to people these days. There used to be a time where that was where that was very common. Um even it, where we would think about someone and just and just share with them, thinking about you today. We're, we're not doing that as much these days, and we really should do a lot more of it because we all need to be coached. We all need to be coached. We all need to be encouraged, and we all benefit from consistent contact and encouragement from believers, don't we? We we benefit from engaging with the body of Christ because at the end of the day, the more that we feel embraced by the body is the harder it is to get pulled away into sin. And it says, so it says to talk to, so encourage your brothers and sisters, reach out to them, talk to them, lift them up so that none of you become hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It doesn't take much for, for you to pull away and fall back into the traps of sin. When, when you step outside of the hedge of protection and the, a great way to keep somebody in is to keep them engaged. Yep. Lisa's adding, she says, neglect not the assembling of the brethren. Hey, I love that. That's one of my favorite scriptures. Mind you. Um, but yes, th- these are all reasons why we have to stay connected because as people are outside of the hedge of encouragement, it's harder for them to stay strong, much harder for them to stay strong. Yes. And, um, you know, since, since this, con- you, since this conversation is about, is about this. I'm going to just you know, consistently remind you that this is also for the giver and the taker. I want you to always think of these, these scriptures on both sides of the coin. Are you the person receiving? Are you the person giving? Um, and if you're feeling in, in this, in this sense, if you're feeling disconnected or separated from your church or your church family in any way, you may want to ask yourself, you might want to ask yourself if you're the part, if you're entering into this hardness of sin and deceitfulness, if you're entering that, you might want to ask yourself, when was the last time that you shared any encouragement with any of them? If you're feeling disconnected, what have you done to stay connected? Are you, are you yourself being a person who's connecting or sending encouragement or, or trying to stay in the, in the place of protection or helping to bring somebody else in it? You know, it, you should be extending as well too, you know, it's like, you know, have, so ask yourself, have I extended myself to anyone that needs it? Am I extending what I am expecting back? That's another great question. Have I, am I extending what I wanted, what I want extended back? You know, do you engage only when you have a need or avoid in your life? Is that the only time that you're engaged with the body? You know, these are all things to consider. It's like how, you know, what is my level of encouragement and interaction with others? And what am I expecting from them that I'm not doing myself? And so <clears throat> I like your ad, Lisa. She says, Jesus is the great shepherd. We are the sheep. The sheep partly have strength from predators being a part of a large gathering of the herd. You are absolutely correct. And so being part of, knitted into that group is part of how we stay safe. It's a safety thing for us. Strength in numbers. Mm-hmm. So, so we've talked about, we've talked a little bit about, about what it means to encourage one another and how encouragement even helps those of us who are struggling when they become the encourager. We've also talked about love, um, what about this? Let's talk about caring. Somebody has already mentioned caring. Here's a scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 24 through 25. Let's look at that one. It says, it says, while our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Whoa. That's something. You know what? I love this scripture so much, and it's, and it's, it's an interesting one to tease out. And so what I did was I, I went ahead, and I'm going to give it to you also in the message so you can hear it a different way, or hear it a little bit more digestibly because it's really good. These are brain teasers. It says, it says here, I, um, 
Hold on, let me do one more click. It says here, if anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. It's saying, if anything, this is what you should do. Have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to full-bodied hair? <laughs> so the way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we don't mention, the parts we mention, and the parts we don't. I like this read. Any, anybody want to share some thoughts on that? Yes, Lisa, I hear you. Pinky toes hurt when they're broken. They sure do. And they hurt everywhere. They hurt the whole body. <laughs> you ever stub your toe? You feel that, and you will stop for it. <laughs> you will stop for it. Yeah, but what, what, what about this? This is a, this is a neat scripture. And I, and I really like how it talked about the parts that are exposed versus the parts that are not exposed. It's like, yeah, we all spend a lot of time doing that hair every single day because it's, the, it's an exposed part. But when you don't feel well internally and your digestion isn't good, I don't think you're worrying about your hair so much. So every, every, every part of your body has a purpose and a need, you know? So, so what are your thoughts on this? How do you see yourself? How do you see yourself in the body? How do you see yourself in your connectedness and, and how necessary you are? Mm -mm. Don't dress her. Well, Come on, Indiana. Well, I think sometimes we think, well, if I don't have that much education or training or I'm not as good as somebody else or something, that they're more important than I am. And I like the scripture says, that's not true. Mm. Uh, the least. And what says too, the last will be first and the first will be last. So just because you're shining and getting all the attention doesn't mean that you're, you're going to be at the back of the line at one point. Amen. <laughs> so, you know, everybody in God's sight, he loves, it's not only inclusive, but he loves each of us because we are his. You are so and right about I, it. We measure, you know, we have a, this thing humans do, we have a, a way of measuring or judging or however you want to put it, and God doesn't see us that way. And here again, love as he loves. And um, thank God. <laughs> uh, it's just, Talk about equal opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> equal opportunity, so nobody, God. Nobody should feel that they're not important or they're less important because in God's sight, you are. Um, uh, just because you have one person that's a star singer or, you know, a talent of this, this, you know, God says, everybody is important and it's a blessing to him when we honor him and when we find joy in him it, it reflects and and god is pleased that he he is joyful when we are are listening to him and learning and growing in him uh, everybody not just the well school the well you know super smart or whatever uh but uh the little guy it's it just like uh they were saying, you know, oh, I, I'm, I'm praying. The guy in the in spiritual, oh, he was a great, you know, he's praying out loud, and and oh, look at that guy in the corner, he's just worth nothing. And <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> not true at all. His his little prayer, our out times yours because it's coming from the heart. <laughs> Absolutely, it's coming and, from uh, the heart. So, uh, yeah, uh, talk about inclusiveness. It's, uh, and God loves us where where we are and who we are, and uh, it's amazing. It's just humbling. 
and, uh, and, and a blessing to know that we don't have to be uh, the brightest star on the whatever to be loved by God just as much as anybody else. So true. And, you know, yeah. it's funny you were talking about the school thing and, and just you know, the smarts and, and where people land, because Lisa was, was also chiming in saying, and I can tell you personally from experience, if you go into a church thinking your schooling is going to further you wrong, it's about humbleness, <laughs> teachable spirit and giving as much as you can when you can. Totally agree yeah. on these on these on yeah. these chiming in and the, the, using that foolish to confound the wise piece. I, it's true. You just yeah. we don't get the say on that. You know, this is. God designed our bodies as a model for understanding how things work together, yeah. as the word says. And it's interesting to read it this way because we place a lot of significance. You, you touched on all of that. You, we place a lot of significance on the positions and the people who show up well. It's like everybody wants to work and serve and hang out with the people who show up well. We want to serve and give more to people who are doing better and forget that we're also as healthy as the weakest limb, right? And so if we're not spending time in support and helping those who, who need support, you know, we are just as, our, us as a group, as a church, is just as healthy as that person among us, you know? And so we, we do have that responsibility to care for each and every person, love everybody, make sure that we are bearing one another's burdens. Yes, Bev is adding, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so, and know that they have a very special, everyone has a special spot and a special role here. And you might not see it every single day, but there's going to come a time where that person's, that person's role is going to be the thing that keeps the whole ship going. So you want to make sure that you honor those roles. He knows why he's made them that way. You know, it's so true. Yes. Yep, Lisa, I totally agree. I'm telling you, there's so I wish everybody could see these comments. Oh my God. <laughs> these are some good comments. I try to read them as often as I can out loud because there's just so much to say there. I mean, she said, you know, a, a well-placed word of wisdom and knowledge will be always outdistanced by worldly knowledge, which the which by the way, loving worldly knowledge is a religion too. Yes, it is. It absolutely is. Sometimes we're we are so we're so hungry. For we are so hungry for direction that we have created a religion out of the things that we that link us to success or make us look successful, and we have to be really thoughtful that we are that we are created in one image, and that is in an image of God, and so we have a responsibility to live up to those standards in the whatever unique way He's given us to reflect that back to Him. And I think that goes back to what I was saying at the beginning of this today is that you, when we worship, that our job is to find. Not only the thing, the, the gateway tools that we normally use, which we all get into together, right? We might be prayer or soaking or whatever we're doing, but to find our uniqueness and how we live our lives and give that back to God, reflect it back because he gave it to us to do that. We are a very special facet of the picture. And so we will, this diamond doesn't shine as brightly without that facet. We need to make sure that your facet is shining. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yep. Uh, another, another example I'd like to share along that line. Um, here again, you know, we think, well, this person is is far more blessed because you know they're they're far more intelligent or whatever. Uh, in that same church uh, in Chicago, mm -hmm. we had a young fellow, and he was extremely mentally challenged. Mm -hmm. He could not read a book. He could not read a newspaper. He asked God, please help me read your scripture. <laughs> he could read the Bible and memorize scripture. Wow. But he couldn't read a newspaper. Talk about a shining star. Wow. And yet he, he was very challenged. But, uh, <laughs> wow. What a beautiful thing. Oh, it's amazing. So God, God can do. work in and through anyone who gives their heart to him. Mm. So true. Mm. Power, powerful. Yeah. Powerful. <laughs> and Lisa was sharing a story on the complete opposite spectrum, but the same thing in the, in the chat here. She was talking about having a gifted student who was, and everyone was impressed with the amount of trivia knowledge that they had, but no wisdom whatsoever. And so she spent time having to remind that, that student that spewing correct answers is not wisdom. It does, 
It's not the application. It's not, it does, it's not the only thing that matters in life, but it, it's what our society puts a lot of value on. Right. And we have right. to, we have to be the balance in that picture. When people come yeah. into the, the house of the Lord and people come into the body of Christ, we have a level setting to do. We have a level setting to do that. We are all equally here that we are fearfully and wonderfully made all in the image of God. And that each person's uniqueness is here to, so to increase this body and to make it better and to make it look more like him. <laughs> Cause that's what it should look like is more like him. Hmm. I, I'm going to tap on Camila. She had mentioned acceptance a little earlier. And I just want to let her know that this is where we're, where I'm taking that next is acceptance. And Romans 14, one through four is a great scripture for this. And I think I, I put, plugged this one into the message message for this class here, but acceptance. I, if you've ever read Romans 14, especially the one through four scripture, this is, this is one that people, um, use a lot of different ways. And this is why, this is why I said, let me put, let me pour this into the message version so that we could keep it on task. I'm going to, I'm going to read it to you. And it says, welcome with open arms, fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Even when it seems that they are strong on opinions, but weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. For instance, a person who may have been around for a while might be well convinced that he can eat anything on the table. While another with a different background may assume that he should only be vegetarian and eat accordingly. But since both are guests at Christ's table, wouldn't it be terribly rude if they fell to criticizing what the other ate or didn't eat? God, after all, invited Mm. them both to the table. Amen. Amen. Woo! <laughs> There's a, if you read this in NIV, you you might not tease out all of what all of what God was trying, all of what what Paul was trying to say here. So I wanted to make sure that we did it this way. So I think we what we have to zero in on here is verse four said. But since both are guests at Christ's table, wouldn't it be terribly rude if they fell to criticizing? what the other ate or didn't eat. God, after all, invited them both to the table. So, do you have any business crossing people off of the guest list or interfering with God's welcome? If there are corrections to be made or manners to be learned, God can help handle that without your help. So God's got this. That ain't your business. <laughs> Woo! And this is adding in. She says, in the last days, many will be offended. This has become a big deal in recent years. Choosing not to respond or not teach or not teach them a lesson might be the best choice of action. It could be be the most loving thing to do in the circumstance. Yes, like on social media. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You mean canceling? We cancel everybody. We cancel. Cancel culture. We cancel everybody. <laughs> and, you know, I was reading this this weekend. And, I, I'm, first of all, this goes out to my mom, Beth, you know, who hates veggies. And I live a complete, like, plant-based life right now. So I'm just making fun of you, Beth, because she's not here. She can't yell at me. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to her yelling at me on Facebook. But um, <laughs> this scripture... <laughs> Um, it says less about food and it says more about acceptance of differences, doesn't it? I mean, does anyone have an example of a story that they, they might want to share about something they've seen in church where people just argue unnecessarily about, you know, anybody want to share a story and tell me a bit about how, how this has been applied or you've seen this happen in our, in our world and how does it as Christians hurt our ability to show the world our Christ likeness when we get into these kinds of fights and spats?
Yes, Lisa's saying church and politics. If you believe X, then you're not a Christian. Woo, yeah. Isn't this the week for this conversation? Where we, where we seem to forget that these are all guests at Christ's table. No matter, no matter what, no matter what side of the aisle you sit on. And I think sometimes in this country we forget that there's more than two parties anyway. <laughs> Check your list. There are many. But I want I want us to remember that, you know, that at the end of the day, no matter where you how you feel about the food on your plate, that you're all we are all guests at Christ's table. Camilla, I hear you. Philosophy, yes, absolutely. Add to that. And, how people how people believe we should live our lives and what's important in it. So true. So true. I've heard people get into arguments over um, the length of skirts or if girls should wear even pants in church. That's been an argument over the years. You've probably heard before that are just like this. Yeah. Uh, is it, it's, you know, it's like, is she welcome here? Is she not welcome here? Because she came in pants. Wow. Really? And some of you yeah. listening might be like, is that really a, seriously a thing? Yeah. And in some places, oh, it's yeah. really a thing. <laughs> yeah. That was a big thing uh, back in the Midwest, in some of the areas, um, you know, long skirts, not just regular <laughs> ones. Um, uh, <laughs> The length of your hair. They said a woman should never cut her hair. Uh-huh. Mm, mm. No makeup. Uh-huh. <laughs> Everybody in this church is going to hell if this is the case. I'm going to tell you that right now. Yeah. <laughs> but we've all violated some version of those things in some way, right? Yeah, right. And then, you know, to argue about well, whether you should kneel or stand when you pray, whether you fold your hands, lift your arms up, or... You know. <laughs> You should be quiet. You'll be saying amen and uh, chiming in. <laughs> I mean, we, we could pick on a whole lot of things. <laughs> I've heard people arguing about the color of the carpet. <laughs> so Does true. God cares? No. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's true. I mean, this is even talking about tithing. Who tithes? is rapture. You know, arguing over over pride and who dominates the conference. It's all pride. It's all pride. And, you know, even as she says, even some denominations say you're not born again if you don't speak in tongues. I had somebody chime in on Facebook about that a few weeks ago. So true. Oh, my I, you know, there's, there's so much. Um, Bev says chips and French fries, different words for the same result. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. It's true. it's true. So, you know, we have to be really, really, really thoughtful. Um, if you, if you, you may own a strong conviction for something one way or another. We're not telling you to not to hold your convictions, but I always say hold firm, firm, firm thoughts loosely because you, because you may not, you may need to understand that person's other side, that that person's life experience, their side of the coin, why they, what their history is, why they believe that way. And it's not your responsibility to, to drag them your way. If there's, as, as the scripture said on the screen, if there's ma- if there's corrections to be made or manners to be learned, God can handle that without your help. We don't need you to be the police. Amen. <laughs> we don't need you to do that. That's not your job. Not to saying about the difference between, you know, judging fruit and, and the rest of it and offering correction. There are things, there's times and places for that, but there are some things that we need to learn to allow God to move on a person's heart. And maybe the heart that gets moved on is yours. Amen. Yes. And none of us have the title of Holy Ghost Junior. Yes, you're right, Camilla. <laughs> she said, Holy Ghost Junior. <laughs> Let's go. One that kind of leads into that is, is kindness. No, you're right. I write, if it's not a conversion in relation to John 3.16, is it absolutely necessary? We have a baseline. We have a baseline. Lisa drew the baseline. So here we go. The Ephesians, here's another one for you. Let's talk about, let's lump a couple of them together. Kindness, forgiveness, and a few other things. We get Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. It says, like the list, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to who? One another. We're back into one another's. Forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. 
this is interesting. They're talking. So who are they talking about? Who's the audience for this scripture? Who's this audience in general? We's, right? We. <laughs> believers. It's telling believers, get rid of the bitterness, the rage, the anger, the brawling, the slander, all quorums of madness, all of it. It says, you believers, be kind and compassionate to one another. We're not even talking about people you consider enemies here. Like people you're close to. <laughs> Forgiving each other, just as Christ and God forgave you. Huh? Something. You know, and this one goes without saying, but it can be hard to do if you're the person who believes that you're right in the situation. You know? And and so where we struggle is where when we require that offending party to extend this to us instead of making sure that we're doing our part to extend the forgiveness to them the way Christ extended it to us. So the so the measure isn't they I did for them, they should do for me. It's I do for them because Christ did for me. Ew, right? <laughs> It's kind of mm. icky when you're the right person, when you're the person in the right, this doesn't feel good. But what we're saying, but this is, this is the truth of it. It says, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God forgave you. So it has nothing to do with their response. Now we want the res- response to be favorable. It has everything to do with you minding your own business, doing your part, do your part. And it says, and it's, so if you're focused if you're focused on delivering that kindness, delivering compassion and forgiveness, you're going to be like, I had some Trinidadian friends that used to say plenty busy. Okay. You're going to be plenty busy just doing that part. You don't have room to be anger, malice, full strife. If you are really focused on doing kindness, compassion, and forgiveness, it takes everything to show <laughs> kindness, compassion, and forgiveness in a situation where you're wrong, where you've been wrong. It takes everything. So you'll be plenty busy if you do your part. Yep. I hear you, Lisa. Point it back. Point it back. <laughs> Camila says, tell me about it. <laughs> yep. But, you know, and there are many other one another's that we can cover. But I'll, I'll give you two more, and then we're going to go into our, our time of um, reflection and communion. But is this helping anybody today? Anybody at all? To just kind of to walk through the scriptures and hear where we're supposed to be? Yeah, me too. Sometimes we need a little refresher on what the word actually says about how we're dealing with our fellow friends, families, and members in Christ. We need a refresher sometimes. Yep. Bev's even said, sometimes you have to apologize even when you're right. Ah, I hate that one, but it's true. <laughs> um, years ago, um, years ago, my bishop, C.L. Morton Jr. used to say, he, the scripture he would, he would apply to that was there the scripture that says, how do you think that you will be able to run with horsemen when you can't even keep up with the footmen. And it's, <laughs> and, it's the two, and and in that scripture, it extends itself to talk about being able to, if you can't extend forgiveness when you're right, how can you, how can you um, even turn the corner when you're wrong? How are you going to even ask for forgiveness when you're wrong? You won't do it. You won't do it. And so I, I will actually probably pull, pull that one up and send it off to folks. Because it's a neat scripture, but it's true. It's like we have to sometimes extend, apologize, even when we're right, because if we are disappointed in the direction that that this has be, gone. You know, Whew. yes, we're praying to to be like the ducks, Lisa. We want all the water rolling off of our backs. We do. <laughs> we need to float, and so that is it. So let's take a look at two more one another's. And so, and just in case you're a little grouchy or salty about this last scripture, this one's for you. It's not that the, not that the um, offender always gets off. So don't worry. Um, Galatians 5, 25 through 26 is a different kind of encouragement. It reads, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Eh. So it's also telling that person, hey, this is the stuff that, that puts you into the trouble to begin with, right? What do you think about this? Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. It's a good one. See, I like, see, there's a lot of offense that takes place because of comparison. I mean, an incredible amount of offense that takes place because of comparison. And comparison i.e. we feel that we are better 
or even feel that we are worse off than another person. And so both sides of that, it's not just when we compare because we think we're better. It's also when we think that we're not as well off. And each of us are an original reflection of God. I don't know how many times I got to say that today, but we're all original reflections of God. And we have far more interesting things to do with our lives than compare them to another sister or brothers. Amen. It's like, you have so much more to offer than wasting your time comparing yourself to someone who is not you, who is not your level of reflection. It's not, not the place for it. So watch out for conceit, watch out for, for pride, watch out for, for provoking and envying each other because that's the stuff that sets people up to do what the other scripture was saying before that, which was what? Getting bitterness, anger, brawling, slight, st- strife, sl- malice, all those things come when you're retaliating or you hit somebody because you're conceited, provoking, and, and envying. <laughs> So they play with each other. They're in the same box. All right, one more. Let's cover one more today. One more, one more. Let's do one more because there are so many of them out there, but we got to end it at some point, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Before we go on, yes, Lisa is adding. She goes, oh, Lord, comparing is death. It keeps you from your assignment. Covetousness. It will end up a circumstantial spanking. Yes. There's a lot of circumstantial spankings that go on because we don't pay, because we're busy wanting somebody else's stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. Last time I checked, it was a part of that original list of commandments, you know, that we can't, we shouldn't covet. We, we should not want what others have. And honestly, and when you hear how sometimes people get what they have, you wouldn't want any, you really wouldn't want it anyway. <laughs> or what it takes for them to maintain it, you really wouldn't want it anyway. You wouldn't want it anyway. So let's go one more time. Ephesians 5, 19 through 20. And... I like this one. It's just, it's, to, it's just really that call to worship one more time. And it reads, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God for the Father and for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I will say here is that we are to enjoy the presence of the Lord together. That's something we should do. Enjoy the presence of the Lord together. Share in the beauty of singing and worship and praise together. These are great things. And we should never forsake the opportunity to assemble together. Like you said, the never forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And because there, God has really special blessings in store for those of us who find joy in community. We need to find joy in community. And he left us to thrive in a community. So as we're getting ready to close and move on to our... Um, I'll move on to our our prayer time. We should take a look at the things that we've discussed about putting into practice today. And this list is much longer than it is right here. But maybe you're willing to pick one that you want to work on this week. Or maybe even this month. Maybe one week is too short. Maybe it's too short. Maybe it's too short. Um, Let's see one. We talked about love, encouragement, care, bearing burdens, Acceptance, being kind, forgiveness, um, don't compare, worship together. And if you notice, these are all things that can help us to find ways to expand our interconnectedness this week, how we can be more connected. And it has very little to do, except for maybe worshiping together. And even still, you know, they have very little to do with physical proximity. Very little to do with physical proximity. They have much more to do with our commitment to being a spiritual community. How we interact. When we do interact with each other, how are we doing it? And what is our heart towards that that other person? So think of all the people in your life that have a limited experience with these one another's. That's as we call them, the one another's. So think about the people in your life who have limited experience with them. This is different than me just saying, okay, look at all, think of all the people in your life that are failing in these. I'm not saying that. This, think of people in your life that you know are struggling in this area. Yes, like you say, Lisa, have heart conditions in this area. And I want you to think about how you can bring this experience to these people in the next week or month. You know, who can you extend love to that doesn't do that very well? Who can you extend forgiveness to who you may not believe deserve it, deserves it? Who can you even extend acceptance to? Someone that you definitely are on a different side of the aisle than. And I want you to really ask the Lord to help you pick someone and make a plan. Make a plan to do it. Someone is looking for you to be be Christ-like today. 
And especially as we're going into this week, I, you know, I can't, I can't say this enough. We're here together on Sunday, but we, we have some things coming ahead of us and we have the opportunity to really hold the banner high for Jesus this week. And so I want you to make that commitment that I am going to be love, forgiveness, acceptance. I'm going to encourage. I'm going to bear burdens. I'm going to accept. I am not going to tell God who sits at his table. I'm not going to tell God who sits on his table. That's his job. And so I want you to think about that and make a commitment to doing it as we go into our time of reflection. And then we're going to move into our communion service. Amen. Good for you today. Amen. We all got something today. Amen. 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 All right. Well, little music. <laughs>